even though we believe we make about 30 decisions about food a day, we make closer to 200. Because it's not just whether we're going to have, you know, Cheerios or Fruity Pebbles, but it's how much we pour, whether we have seconds, whether we finish it, how much milk we put, how much sugar we put on it. But because we don't realize we make that many decisions, we're tremendously influenced by the things around us, by what the person is doing next to us, by the lighting in the room, by whether the TV is on or not. And the solution, therefore, to mindless eating is not mindful eating, because that doesn't work for most of us. Our days are too crazy, or our lives are too packed with too many other distractions. Instead, for most of us, the solution for mindless eating is simply to change our environment so it causes us to mindlessly eat better rather than mindlessly eat terrible. So it's using a smaller cereal bowl because we'll pour more, we'll pour less cereal into a slightly smaller cereal bowl. It's uh, putting it not on the table in front of us, but putting that cereal box on the counter because if we have to get up and even move six feet, we're going to eat on average 20% less cereal. It's making those easy changes around us. Now, in writing the book Slim by Design, what I've realized is that there's not only lots of little changes that we can make, but there's lots of little changes that we can ask other people to make that will help us eat better. Because there's five places that really sort of mess us up when it comes to eating. Okay, it's our home. It's our two or three most frequented restaurants. Now, that's not our favorite restaurants, it's the ones we go to most frequently. Like for me, with little kids, it tends to be McDonald's down the road and the uh, Applebee's down the road. Okay, not my favorite restaurants, but my most frequented. It ends up, ends up being where we do our weekly shopping, where we work, where our kids go to school. And simply making a small set of changes, a small number of changes in these places will help us eat better. But what we can also do is ask our favorite restaurant to make changes, our favorite grocery store to make changes that make it easiest for us to eat healthier. A lot of restaurants want to make it easier for us to eat better if they can make money. A lot of grocery stores want to make it easiest for us to shop better because they make a whole lot more money when we buy fruit versus fruity pebbles. Because fruit spoils. Fruity pebbles will never spoil. So they really want us to eat better, but they don't know how. One of the things we find is that for every minute that a person spends in the produce aisle, up until about the 14th or 15th minute, they spend an extra dollar. So the key for a grocer or a smart grocer keep you in here longer, okay? Well, one of the things we find that determines how long a person stays in a produce aisle ends up being how many turns they have to make. So if you set up your grocery store so that a person has to make a lot of zigzag turns before they get out of there, they'll end up buying a lot more food. And so what I've done is pooled together all the research we've done, some research for different grocery store chains, some research for different restaurants, pooled it all together and said, here's what you can do. One of the things we say is, hey, you know, ask your favorite restaurant to provide you a half-sized portion of at least its most popular entrees. You know, you, know, you might say, whoa, no, what restaurant in the right mind would do that? That's crazy talk, crazy. It's like, no, it's not. I'm going to talk about a study we did where we went to a truck stop, you know, probably one of the most you know, villainous <laughs> restaurants for serving fatty food or bad food. And what we did is we offered half-sized portions at this truck stop. And what we found was crazy. Yeah. First of all, the truck stop started selling a lot more. The, the bills in the truck stop, or I guess you should say the uh, um, check size, went up dramatically. Because instead of people going in and splitting a big entree, they each got a half-sized portion. And because they weren't stuffed, they ended up maybe getting a side salad or dessert. Or they got some coffee afterwards because uh, they were uh, still hungry. So what we found is that people did end up eating about 30% less, but they spent more money. The book very objectively has, at the end of, for each of these zones, where our home, restaurants, grocery stores, where we work, where kids go to school, it has 100 point scorecards. Very objectively ask questions like, is your kitchen counter clean? If you say yes, you get a point. If you say no, that's kind of cluttered, you get zero. And simply by going through a scorecard and seeing how well you do, or how well your restaurant does, or how well your grocery store, or how well your kid's school does, it very specifically says whether your home's making you fat by design or slim by design, 
whether your favorite restaurant's making you fat by design or slim by design, but more importantly, it says exactly what you can do or ask them to do to turn things around and help you instead of hurt you. And I think that's so powerful. And then also in the book and at the website, slimbydesign.org, we have all these sample letters that you can send your favorite restaurant owner, your favorite grocery store owner. You can send the CEO of the grocery chain if you want to. You can send your favorite fast food restaurant that letters, tweets, Facebook posts that let them know that you're thinking about them, you appreciate what they do, but you also have some ideas about what they could do next. So we're doing this really cool study. We call it the, the Syracuse study because we went to 100, 239 households up in Syracuse, New York, and, uh, and one kind of crazy thing we, we saw, a lot, of the, a lot of the heaviest people had side-by-side -side refrigerators. And I think what goes on is that you have a side-by-side -side refrigerator, we, we find the very first food you see, you're three times more likely to take than the fifth food you see. And if the first food you see when you open the refrigerator is really unhealthy stuff, like that frozen chocolate cake or that fudge sickle right here, or that not frozen chocolate cake right here, um, that has almost an unfair sort of advantage of being selected. But what happens when you uh, put that freezer on the bottom, for instance, if you have a, free, a refrigerator with a freezer on the bottom, is that you have to like get down your knees, it's inconvenient, you gotta bend over, where the, if the refrigerator's on the top, not only is everything else there, but that fruit and vegetables is right a lot closer to eyesight and stuff. So, so we find there's a rough correlation, not causation, rough correlation between having a freezer on the bottom and being a little more slim. My focus for at least the next six or seven years is going to be on making sure this slim by design movement gets off the ground to make sure that we can, can get these principles at work in, the, in a health and wellness places and work sites to make sure that we can actually set up some sort of a certification, some sort of a standards board for, for restaurants or for grocery stores so that they can say, look, here's this, we've, we've made these changes. Look what we are doing to help you shop better. I also, also want to do something with, uh, with consumers to make sure that we get this in the consumer psyche that clean that counter, make sure there's no breakfast cereal sitting on it, make sure that there's a fruit bowl sitting on it, this and this and this and this and this, that we really change the way kitchens look too in America. I'm actually taking an entire sabbatical off next year at half pay <laughs> to, to, to do this, just to focus on actually making sure this stuff goes out and changes these institutions to help make us dun, 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 slim by design. <laughs>